Aloha and welcome to our video on matter. The goals for today's video are to explain how elements are related to minerals. We will identify the kinds of particles that make up atoms. We'll explain the differences between ions and isotopes and then we'll explain what compounds are and describe why they form. And finally we'll compare and contest the three major types of chemical bonds. To begin we should talk a little bit about elements. When we're talking about elements here what we're talking about is a pure substance. Um, and elements are substances that are made up of only one kind of atom. So all the atoms are going to be the same. Um, so when we talk about the element of hydrogen, which is this one right over here, then what we're talking about is all hydrogen atoms are the same. They all have the same basic properties, and that basic property is the number of protons. Now, this is the periodic table you can see here. It's lined up by periods, which are going to be these guys here that go across. So our rows are going to be the periods. Then you also have columns. And they represent different things. The periods are going to represent the electron level or the energy level for the electrons. And then your groups are going to represent the number of valence electrons per se. And that's how they react with others. So that's the real simple way to look at it that way. Okay, and you'll learn more about the periodic table in the lesson this unit. So when we talk about elements, we say that they all have the same atom. They all share the same, they all look the same, it's that way. So that's kind of what we're talking about here are our atoms. And if you can recall back, an atom has made of primarily two parts. We have this nucleus here, which is in the inside of the atom, and that's where we find the protons and the neutrons. And then orbiting around in these energy levels, and this is what the periods were for the periodic table, we can find the electrons for an atom. So if we recall back, we have our protons, which are gonna be these guys here, and our protons have a positive one charge, and their mass is one atomic mass unit, and they're found in the nucleus. And they're represented by these red circles in here. We also have neutrons, and neutrons are called that because they have no charge. They also have a mass of one atomic mass unit, and they're also found in the nucleus, and those would be the little blue ones in here as well. And then we end up with our electrons. The electrons have a negative one charge. Their mass is one 1,874th of a proton, so they're really negligible. They really don't count. And these are the ones we find in these energy levels or these orbitals out here, okay? When you look at the periodic table, you're gonna see each element's gonna have its own box here, and each of the things inside kinda tells us what it is. We have our symbol, which is a shorthand version of writing down which element it is, and then we'll have the common name as well. And those ones you can see for this one, we have a symbol of C, which represents carbon. They're going to have an atomic number, which is going to be the number of protons. And in a neutral atom, it's also the number of electrons, but primarily we want you to focus down that it's the number of protons. And then we have a bigger number down here. This is going to be the atomic mass, and this tells me the average mass of that element, and it's primarily the number of protons and the number of neutrons. So that's what we need to know about atoms moving forward. Okay, for an element, we can't take an atom and we can't change the number of protons. If we change the number of protons in an element, then what we're doing is we're changing the element it is. So in our example here in the pictures, we're looking at carbon. For all of our carbon atoms, you can see here, they're all gonna have six protons, and that's what defines it as being carbon. We can change the number of neutrons, and when we change the number of neutrons, we create what we call an isotope. And an isotope is just going to be an atom that has a varying mass number. And the reason the mass number changes is because we have different number of neutrons. The proton stays the same, that's what makes it carbon, but the neutrons can change its atomic mass. If we look in the most common form of carbon, it's going to be this carbon-12 here, we'll notice that there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 neutrons here. If we go to carbon-13, which is also stable but not as common, we know there's still going to be our six protons, but now we have seven neutrons. So it's going to be a little bit heavier version. And then we get to our fun little buddy over here, this carbon-14. And carbon-14, because it's carbon, tells us we have six protons, but we're going to have eight neutrons. Okay, and this one is radioactive, it's unstable, and this is what we use to date modern things. Anything to about 50,000 years ago we can use carbon-14 dating on. But isotopes are just going to be varying mass numbers of an atom. It's the same element, though, because it, remember, it can, maintains that same number of protons. Okay, so we just learned that you can't change the number of protons. 
but you can change the number of neutrons and that's what makes an isotope. You can also change the number of electrons. And when we change the number of electrons, then we create what we call an ion over here, okay? And our ions are quite simply just a charged atom, okay? So we charge it by removing or gaining an electron. So we'll look over here and we'll see here that we have our nucleus and we have our orbiting electrons. We have an electron here and an electron here. And then if we take this electron out, we end up with what we call a cation. And a cation has this little T, so you can remember that little T tells me it's going to be positive. And the reason it's positive is because now it has more protons than electrons, so it has a net positive charge, and that's why we call it a cation. We can do the same if we add an electron, then we end up with an anion, and an anion has this N inside for negative, so these are going to be our negatively charged ions. And you can see that down here. If I lose an electron, now I have more protons, it's positive and it's a cation. If we gain an electron, we have more electrons, so it has a net negative charge and it's going to be an anion. And we can see that happens here with sodium chloride. And we'll talk about sodium chloride a lot in this class. But if we see our sodium here, we're going to take this single solitary electron and we're going to give it to chlorine. Chlorine has one empty space. You can see that empty space is right down here. So when we put this electron here, we end up with a full outer shell, but a negative charge. And we have a full outer shell here because we dropped down one. Now we have a positive charge because we have more proteins. And the positive and negative attract each other. And that's how we form sodium chloride or salt. Now we talked earlier about elements. And we said that elements have one kind of atom. And that means that all the atoms are going to have the same number of protons. We can also make what we call compounds. And compounds have two or more kinds of atoms. Okay, So we can have an element. We have helium here, which is a single atom, or we can have oxygen. And even though there's two atoms, we notice that they're the same. That's why it's still an element. When we get into the case of water, notice how water has both hydrogen and oxygen. So we have two different kinds. That's what makes it a compound. So remember, a compound has two or more kinds of atoms. If it's just one kind of atom, it's still considered an element. Now, jumping back to electrons again, we're going to talk a little bit about what we call valence electrons. And valence electrons are the ones in the outer shell. And we kind of hinted at that when we were looking at ions. And valence electrons determine how it's going to bond or react with other elements. So we can see in our group at the periodic table, in group one, we have one valence electron. In group two, we're going to have two valence electrons, and so on and so forth as we go across. Now, group three is going to have three, but then we jump to 13. And the reason we do that is because we generally tend to focus more of our attention on the first 20 or so elements to show us how these work. So 13, get rid of the one, we have three. 14, 15, 16, 17. And then group 18, these guys are going to have eight. Now, helium only has two because it's in the first energy level, and that one only holds two electrons. But these ones are going to be full, and these are where we call our noble gases or our inert elements. And these are the ones that, because they're full, they generally tend not to react. These that are missing a space from eight, so they have seven, they're going to look to gain an electron. And these guys here that have only one electron, they kind of want to get rid of that one. So we'll talk about bonding a little bit more in the lesson, but I just wanted you to get an idea of what we call valence electrons, and those are the outermost ones. Now there's three primary types of bonds we'll talk about in the course. The first one is going to be ionic, so we can pretty much tell that we're going to be dealing with ions. So if we remember back and we look at sodium, sodium had one valence electron out here, and we have chlorine. Chlorine has seven valence electrons, but it has this little empty spot over here. It would like to have a full complement of eight. What they'll do is the sodium will give up its electron. And when it gives up its electron, it now has more protons, and now it becomes a positive ion. The chlorine is going to gain this electron. So now it has more electrons than protons, so it has a net negative charge. And we get this ion. And then the positives and the negatives, the positive in sodium and the negative in chlorine, they're going to attract each other. And that's how we form table salt down here. And you can see another example here. We have calcium that has two valence electrons. And it's going to give one to each of these fluorines. And then we end up with calcium that has a plus two charge, because it's going to have two more protons than electrons, plus each of these fluorines, which are going to have a negative one charge. So two minus one minus one is going to be zero. And that's what's going to make this an ionic compound that's going to work. 
So ionic bonds are when we form ions. So we have a positive and a negative ion, and those two are going to attract to each other. And that's how we form those compounds. Okay, the next type of bond we're going to talk about are these covalent bonds. And covalent bonds differ from ionic bonds. And ionic bonds, if you can recall, we gave away or we gained electrons when we formed ions. In covalent bonds, we're going to share these electrons. So what we'll notice is we'll take this hydrogen first, and our hydrogen, each one is going to have one electron like so. The oxygen over here is going to have six. So this is going to be a two, three, four, five, six. Now, for oxygen to be happy, it wants to have eight total electrons around it. For the hydrogens to be happy, they want to have these two electrons around it. So what they end up doing is they'll end up sharing this pair. So when they do so, that means oxygen now has eight at any given moment, and each of the hydrogens will have two electrons at any given moment. Now this is what makes it a covalent bond, and because they're sharing the electrons, they tend to be a stronger bond. Okay, So that's the difference. Ionic, we give up the electrons. Covalent, we share the electrons. Okay, the third and final type of bond is this metallic bond. And metallic bonds deal with metals, and we can see it's kind of ionic. These metal ions are here, and they release these electrons. And these electrons kind of just pool around all of the different ions, and they can move back and forth, they can flow around, and that's what makes it a little bit of a different bond. The benefit of this is that if I send electricity through it, we can put all these little electrons into motion, and that's how we get a current. So metallic bonds allow us to have things like wires and things of that nature. Okay, so that's it for this video. As always, good luck with the lesson, and we will see you in the next video.